delighted to welcome you to the 14th Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Detol. It is our pleasure to present today the book launch of Name Place Animal Thing, the Reba Lindum in conversation with Janice Parriot. There were no longer any signs of the house we stayed in, no doorway with its low entrance, no weeping willow or cryptomeria tree from which the caterpillars fell. The ramshackle cottage that housed my earliest friends and shaped my memories lay, lay bare and forgotten. Only the flying termites remained, fluttering below the streetlights outside the property. Dariba Lindum's debut novel, Name Place Animal Thing, follows the life of a young Khasi woman in the politically charged city of Shillong. Traversing her journey to adulthood, the tale evocatively presents her changing perceptions of identity, selfhood and differences. Writer and civil servant Lindum currently works with the Indian Revenue Service and is Deputy Commissioner of Customs. In conversation with poet and writer Janice Pariat, Lindum delves into the boundaries between the warmth of childhood and with time the loss of a certain kind of innocence. Dariba Lindum is a writer and civil servant from Shillong. The In Place Animal Thing is her debut novel. She currently works with the Indian Revenue Service as a Deputy Commissioner of Indirect Taxes. Janice Pariat is the author of Boats on Land, a collection of short stories and Seahorse, a novel. Her novel, The Nine Chambered Heart, is being translated for publication into 10 languages, including Italian, Spanish, French and German. Please do remember to comment by typing it into the comment section. You can also post questions to the Reba. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present Name, Place, Animal, Thing, the Reba Lindum in conversation with Janice Parriot. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, here we are again on a screen, um, but it is always, always a pleasure um, to be part of these uh, JLF conversations. So a very warm welcome to everybody who's taken a nice long lunch break and has joined us on this rather beautiful day. Um, we're two Shillong girls sitting here. Um, so that's going to be a lot of fun, I can promise you. Um, it's always special, like I said, to be um, in a JLF session, but it's even more special today because precisely uh, for this reason um, that we share um, similar roots, um, the same hometown. Um, and I'm so sort of so proud and so um, happy to be here with Dariba. Dariba, I want to say congratulations. It's your first book. How are you feeling? Hi, Janice. Nice, nice to have speak to you as well. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's my first book. I'm all kinds of nervous. My first mm -hmm. interview as well. Mm -hmm. First book launch. People watching. So mm -hmm. I'm nervous and excited at the same time. And I'm happy that I've been I'm being interviewed by you. And we can have conversations and reminisce. Talk yes. about the book. Yes. Get people excited Absolutely. about it. Absolutely. And you should be excited about it. First of all, it's your first book. Um, and there's nothing that can beat that feeling of having a first book out in the world. Um, it's really special. And I so wish that we were face to face holding, um, holding, gosh, I almost knocked my cup of tea over. But in my great excitement, I wanted to say, I wish we were holding a, co a copy of your book up and People were taking pictures of us and we could have posted them on Instagram later. But we will do that some other day. For today, we we hold it up virtually um, and, um, you know, we celebrate it and um, we sort of um, mark um, your book or the, 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 the journey that your book will make. Um, into the world. Yeah, I was just telling you uh, when we were chatting that I enjoyed it so, so much. Um, you know, a lot of people say that they, they read books because they, you know, they, or they enjoy books because they are relatable. Um, so relatability becomes, you know, a thing that, that people place quite a weight on. And I've always been a little wary of the word because I feel like books should take you, you know, to 
far off places and you sort of encounter people that you wouldn't normally meet um, otherwise and you read sort of you know stories that you might not have heard of um, but encountering your book felt you know it felt beyond uh, the element of relatability it felt so much like so many of your memories were my memories of growing up in Shillong at a very particular time during a very particular you know point in its history um, and having that same kind of perhaps because we both live outside Shillong as well now having that same kind of tug and longing um, for Shillong um, you know in, in the same way. Um, now we'll talk you know obviously a, a lot about the book in just a little bit but the question that I always love to ask uh, debut writers is what has your journey been into writing and how did you know how did you come to writing or how did writing come to you? Uh, I wasn't always a writer. Mm -hmm. I didn't write in school. I didn't write in college. I wrote I wrote sometimes for college because they insisted if you write uh, an article for the college magazine, then we'll, uh, we'll forego the fact that you bunked so many classes in political science or something like that. So I would write then, but I wasn't much of a writer. It's maybe, I, I don't know. I never, I always knew I wanted to write, but I never felt like writing. I felt... I needed to read more before writing. I felt uh, I was unripe and I was not ready for it. And you, I had all these stories in my head, but they were not crystallizing. Yeah. So I needed for that to happen. And I actually wrote one of the stories in the book first. And when I, write, I wrote that story, I showed it to a couple of people and they really liked that story. Yeah. And... I thought, oh, you like this story? I have a couple more stories. Maybe I should write those. Then more stories tumbled out, more stories. And after the book was finished, I have 10 stories in the book. After the book was finished, and editing was over. Then I thought, oh, no, I have this other story. I should have added it in there as well. And this other story, and this other story. So the stories keep tumbling out after you have one story out. Yeah. You know, you have one story put down on pen and paper or on your computer and yeah. then you think of the other ones. How lovely. It's almost like a domino effect. No? Yeah, like a domino like, effect. Exactly. It's yeah. kind of unleashed and then it just kind of flows, um, you know, like a dam that's burst. Yeah. Um, and who are these writers that you were reading? Who are the storytellers in your life? I know, of course, because we grew up in Shillong, we, we have an ear for stories, I think, and I see it in your book as well, that there are many people around this character who are telling stories. So who were the storytellers, storytellers in your life and who were the writers that you were reading? I was reading, I was reading, to be frank, I was reading everything I was getting my hands on. I wasn't reading fancy, you know, Dostoevsky or anything of the sort. I, I don't want to sound like I, I've read the masters or something. I read whatever I could get my hands on. I read Nancy Drew okay. to Charles Dickens, to George Eliot, to Mills and Boons. I read everything that I could read. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's only when you, I grew up later and then you have um, in Shillong, there are not many bookstores. Yeah. So you only had to rely on those bookstores. It's only when I came out of Shillong, went to the bigger bookstores, went to, you know, Cafe Turtle in Khan Market, then you could see all the nice books with the nice covers. Then, you know, you pick up, oh, here's a Ray Bradbury. Mm -hmm. So I read Ray Bradbury's uh, short stories and I was like, I thought, okay, I could, I could write a short story. Mm -hmm. And I was never even a science fiction fan. Yeah. But reading his stories really made me want to write, especially his story, his book called uh, Dandelion Wine. It's about him, him growing up in his mm -hmm. in Middle America and how he grew up, and same kids through the perspective of children. I really liked that, and thought, okay, I that I held on to that, yeah. and when I came up with my book. Then I I kind of went back to that. 
Yeah. And even when reading um this other book called uh, Swallowing Mercury by uh, Violet Gregg, I was really inspired by her book. She talks about uh, growing up in a uh, Catholic uh, Poland and yeah. the communist communism yeah. hanging over her head and the way she wrote her stories, you know, kid her naivety and you know how she experiences the world yeah. these kind of books they really inspired me to write my own books so and i only encountered these books much later in life and that's why maybe i felt inspired much more yeah. later, much later in life yeah well they say that you the books always find you at the right time so clearly you know they found you at the right time in your life and they stayed with you for a reason and they translated in some way into your own writing which is which is rather lovely um you know i i know that we we keep you know we say we use the word novel um for your book a uh, name place animal thing um but i was struck actually by how uncategorizable it is um i don't know if this is something that you know you set out deliberately to do and totally fine if you didn't um but i loved how it doesn't quite fit the form of a traditional novel um and it doesn't quite i mean they are short stories but they also sort of verge so much on the form of the personal essay um so there's a little bit of memoir there's a little bit of chronicle there's a little bit of you know short story but it is sort of put together like a like a like a a coming of age novel so i love that it it you know it's filled into so many um sort of categories and i was really intrigued i really wanted to know how you kind of hit upon this this form or how did it come to you was it something that just sort of came naturally was it something that you thought about deliberately uh well it, yes you're right it's very amorphous some people ask me is this fiction is this non fiction can it be categorized as fiction i said i would like it to be categorized as fiction if it can be categorized but you're right it's very amorphous in that it's a coming of age the different stories that can be read individually yes. but they are all connected at the same way if you read the last chapter and go go backwards it's not like you're going to miss anything or if you start smack in the middle you're not going to miss anything but it would be of course advisable to start from beginning to end <laughs> um when i when i wrote the first story that i said which yeah. uh, i gave to a lot of people and they like mm -hmm. and uh when i set out to write it i i did think that yes i wanted them to be isolated stories yeah. but that somehow connected in a way that they could be read isolated but yeah. they can be read together so i did want that mm -hmm. i don't know and perhaps they will come up with a categorization of this guy but <laughs> it totally doesn't matter and i love that they fall beyond labels and beyond categories and i was so intrigued by this form because you know when you come across a, a form that you haven't before it's a little almost disconcerting and i like that disconcertion that mm -hmm. this is the text is forcing you to rethink your categories um and it's forcing you to encounter the world in the story and outside it in a very different way and and i i mean it with you know the greatest compliments i really love this unusual form that you that you that you picked on um and and it's wonderful to know that you just kind of you just wrote them um just with this thought in mind and it just sort of came together so organically in a way right i mean i'm lucky i i'm lucky it wasn't a hot pot mess <laughs> different stories mm -hmm. but i'm so glad that you noticed that and i hope other people when reading the novel notice what you notice yeah. as well i mean um uh, of course everybody's uh they go into a piece of literature or film and they will take from it what they will but you know when 
they take from it what you want them to that's that's a plus side oh that is such a plus and it's also a little bit rare so it's very yeah. special I, i feel like okay so i was able to convey what i did something right <laughs> yeah, i did something right so it feels good that you were able to catch that and hope others catch it as well i'm and, sure they will i'm sure they will you know you <laughs> like okay black age you know, okay i didn't just go about writing 10 different stories and expecting yeah. people to not get it so, yeah. not at all and there are echoes between them and resonances and characters that show up sort of repeatedly like yuva Uh, who is such a strong presence by the end of the book it was devastating by the way and we'll talk about that in a little bit um but it was so cleverly done that you kind of leave this little trail of breadcrumbs um so they have been knitted um you know together um but to follow up on that question i'm also interested in knowing why um or how you came to pick these particular characters or these particular instances or these particular spaces uh within um you know your childhood sort of hometown because when we think about places when we think about shillong there's so much that we can write about right i mean it's hard to choose it's almost impossible in fact to kind of write about everything so obviously there is a very deliberate um curation i suppose if that's the right word uh, a curation process where we say you know these are the stories that i want uh, in a book about place and family and i was just wondering how you uh, hit upon them because they are quite wide ranging you know there's mr bahadur there's mrs chavedi the hindi teacher there's um you know the the kong um uh the uh, namyarap the one who comes you know b i think i don't know if you say b or or b i say b b b okay um come b you know who comes to help and then of course there's yuva um and then there's um you know the the graveyard the cemetery space where you know the grandfather has been buried and it becomes a ritual to go there and pay sort of you know love and respect to him every year so i was just wondering how you came to these particular people and these particular um spaces uh the book is sort of a fictionalized version of events that happened to me mm-hmm. they're not all things that happened to me they are of course embellished heavily embellished but uh there are certain people i don't know for some reason that stuck with me and certain stories that people told me that stuck with me and um that seemed to have a very um they had they weighed heavy on me at that time and you know when you are older your memory starts to it starts to remember things differently it embellishes or it you know minuses things from the story right so that may have happened here as well i might have embellished i might have forgotten something but the feeling the feeling i had the feeling of happiness sadness confusion that stays the same uh, the story around it the bits of it the details yeah. might become hazy but the feeling always remains the same and i must have stuck those feelings must have kind of stuck to me and i wasn't able to um let them go that's mm-hmm. why these particular because yeah. as you're growing up and even till now and as you grow older you'll always meet people who you you may meet someone who you spend time with every day or once a week and that person might not strike you as much as that one person you met on the road who gave you some sort of you know aphorism or some informational tidbit somehow there's that that stays with you more than maybe something a friend says every day so it's kind of like that that feeling that stays yes. with you that stayed with you how lovely and i think that your book actually does so well to evoke that feeling you know and it's not just about nostalgia i think that becomes a very convenient word to use um especially for books like this but i think it's so much you know more than that um like you said it is 
um, it's a feeling, but it also transforms you um, in some way. And that's why you find yourself writing about it, you know, at some point. Um, um, I heard a very, very small, you know, quick question about the title. If you could just tell us a little bit about name, place, animal thing, um, which I also love. And then perhaps after telling our audience about the title, you could do a little reading so we could hear from the book as well. Yeah, sounds great. So um, the, the title. So yeah. let me start by saying when uh, anybody from the Northeast writes about when they expect, they expect certain writers coming from problem areas to write sad stories about, you know, the problems. Tell me about it. <laughs> that, oh, how are you not mentioning yeah. Aspar? You know, then it, you we risk being, you know, categorized and uh, in this particular uh, box of you know oh they're writing from the northeast they must be writing about you know the sad things there and uh, then you have you get stuck in this mire of identity politics and I really I'm not saying that's not a thing that we should do yes there should there should be that but I also think that uh, we should write stories of the mundane mm -hmm. and uh, stories that are universal. And uh, in reading my story, the only difference is perhaps geography, I would say. Mm -hmm. Although when I'm writing something universal, I, I, I want to pick something where people would be able to, at first, you know, at first glance, see the name of a book and be like, oh, I'm familiar with this this title but I know I know this game everyone's played that game mm -hmm. it's a part of everyone's childhood so it's uh it's it harkens to a feeling basically uh of being young and by putting a familiar name like name place animal thing I wanted people to be able to a glimpse of the unfamiliar so you have a universal experience like childhood yeah, um, a, of a girl growing up in a small Indian town with, you know, very uh, uh, similar kind of experiences. Yet they are, they do have that element of difference in the fact that they are set in a different town than theirs, and that I did want that to show. Yeah. So. Uh, name please animal thing just helps get people's attention basically and of yes. course all the store chapters have a name a place an animal thing so it all worked out although I did come up with the name after, after. the stories yeah. so uh, yeah just have people get a glimpse of the unfamiliar through the familiar Melia, that's lovely. And I, you know, honestly wouldn't have thought of it that way. So thank you for sort of, you know, putting it across so nicely. Um, it kind of leaves me with a different sort of approach um, to the book um, now, which is great. Um, but let's hear from the book. Would you like to read for us a little? Let me just uh, open this up. Yeah. Since the book came out as an ebook first, so yeah. I... I wasn't able to get a physical copy, so I got myself a Kindle so I could buy my own book on Kindle and I'm just learning how to use it. So bad at it. Anyways, um, I'm going to be reading from the last chapter. It's mm -hmm. not going to be having any spoilers or anything of the sort because I said before that um, you could read it backwards, you could read it smack in the middle and it's not going to make a difference. Yeah. I'll be reading a short passage from the last chapter, Yuba. At 10, I understood mortality. I learned it that one summer evening when I caught and placed 10 milky white butterflies in a large empty Holix glass jar on the insistence of Bharat, my friend and neighbor. Ali Kang, we shall catch a few. It's fun, he convinced me that evening. Where, I asked. The football field can be it, he said, talking about the open field near the house where the butterflies perched on dandelions by the brambles and the weeds. We crossed the road from my house and began our hunt. After it got too dark for them, I began to get bored. 
you know, I shouted at Varit when I had enough. And there was not enough space for the new ones he was catching. Like with all pretty things, we wanted to possess them. We placed them in a glass jar after we had poked holes in the lid so they could breathe. They felt frail and buttery against our fingers, like the greased paper with which my mother would line cake tins before baking. I saw them try to escape, colliding against the glass until they sank to the bottom of the jar. Many of them lost their wings as they, as they struggled and languished in this glass script. I grew worried when I saw them start to crumple down and in an attempt to save them, I opened the lid and tipped it over. They all dropped in a white powdery heap on the ground. None of them had survived. In that moment, my inchoate mind understood that life is a thing that can be taken away, that I was complicit in the death of a living being and that things can fade and die. The wings, that wings can fall off and sometimes things cannot be saved. Mortality is an ensnared butterfly dying in a glass jar. Thank you. Oh, that was so beautiful and so moving and just incredibly powerful. In fact, much like um, the whole um, story, um, the, and it's the last one, um, and it, 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 it was really the one that completely devastated me and I loved it so much. So I'm so glad you, you chose to read um, from there. Um, thank you for that. Um, I just, I just want us to go, go, go back a little bit to, um, uh, to what we were talking about, um, you know, the, the familiar and the unfamiliar, because I n notice also in your reading and through the book, yeah. there is sort of a, a liberal, you know, um, profusion of Kasi words, Kasi phrases, people sort of, you know, um, uh, telling each other off and, you know, using little expletives and, um, you know, just this very wonderful banter that you have, you know, um, um, with sort of people talking. And of course, you, of course, there, there are mentions of places within Shillong, Rinja and, you know, police bazaar and all of these places that are, of course, they're familiar to me um, so much. Um, but I was wondering, um, just to go back to this sort of familiar, unfamiliar um, point that you brought up earlier, how did you sort of, uh, how did you balance or how did you um, walk that line between sort of the local and the universal and the familiar and the unfamiliar? Because it's something that I, um, I kind of also, you know, feel like I'm a little bit on a, you know, one of those tightrope <laughs> wires. Um, because you're, of course, you're writing for yourself, but you're also writing for, for readers. And how do you, how do you do that? Um, how did you manage with this book? Yeah. Um, I would maybe mix up a little bit of the familiar and the unfamiliar, put a, story that everybody you know a situation that everybody is familiar with yeah. maybe uh, being scared of a parent or getting your first period you know put, yeah. put, put, put a story that like that everyone's every, yeah. or cheating in, in your hindi exam <laughs> yeah cheating in your hindi exam we've all we've all cheated we've all done we've all, especially done, with the hindi exam yeah <laughs> We've all done it. We, we only needed pass marks, so we all we've all done it. Nobody bothered to study with the, with the papers that you just needed pass marks for. So you put in that story, and then you add a little of the unfamiliar. So uh, perhaps in doing that, uh, people get a sense of how things work differently in a different place, and uh, everybody has has a police bazaar or everybody went to uh, a particular video store to go and get their movies yeah. every day the same for me the same animated cartoons day in day out so but then you put in a word like tankiti in there so they'll be like oh yeah just like my place in my small town 
So okay. you, I mix. I, I again, I bring in the familiar, and then yeah. bam, the unfamiliar. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I, I like that. I like that, um, you know, it becomes also then a process of alchemy where you bring these things together and then actually something new um, arises, you know, from that. I've also noticed that you've sort of handled the, the political sort of, you know, context of the place uh, quite sort of skillfully. And in some ways, I never felt that it overshadowed any of the stories. Um, in some ways, it, it never took over the stories, you know, completely. And I was wondering if that was also, in some ways, a case of um, balancing uh, for you, because we we grew up, you know, during or just after the trouble years, as we call them, um, and curfews, buns. Um, you know, uh, encounters between the CRPF and the local militants, etc., were so sort of familiar to us, you know. And I was just wondering how you how you did that as well. The wider sort of political context of the place. How do you manage to weave that into the stories, but without allowing that context to completely take over? So rather than uh, when writing about the political scenario, mm -hmm. uh, rather than a bird's eye view of it, I took a worm's eye view of it, right? So uh, how this affected yeah. the character personally. So yeah. clashes between, you know, Nepalis and Khasis mm -hmm. won't affect an yeah. eight-year-old girl. But if it affected someone, maybe a neighbor, a Nepali neighbor got hurt, mm -hmm then that's something that's very close to her. It's affecting her directly. People are talking about Mr. So-and-so in the next door neighbor who got hurt. So when it brings the, the political, comes so close to home, that's, that's when it affects, the, it affects children. And uh, that's how I wanted to write about it. I didn't want to write about the politics giving any, you know, commentary on it because mm -hmm. it's not a commentary of an adult it's yeah. a commentary of a child how a child saw this uh, yeah. how buns were seen how she would remember everybody running to buy bread and milk for some reason uh, mm -hmm. even though the bun was just for a day it was announced just for a day but everyone started panicking yeah. again this politics coming inside the house and so she would not understand why this was happening unless it affected her directly. And that's, I think, how most children operate. Unless it affected them directly, they're not going to understand it. So yeah. if my, if a person's parent was saying, this is bad because see this happened to, you know, yeah. our neighbor, that would be more understandable. So, and again, uh, writing, I didn't want to call it, I wanted to be very touch and go with all these things. I didn't want to ha sit there, mull over politics or how, you know, it's affecting the region. There are better people to write that, more informed people to write that. Yeah. I, I can say with confidence I'm not as informed as the rest of the people. <laughs> so I can only write what I felt. Yeah. You know, drawing on my own experiences as well. Like you said, bun, curfew, and stone throwing, and going out on our bicycles. That's yeah. what we remember about these things. Yeah. And we, and that was in the late 80s. Yeah. So we will grow up in the aftermath of yeah. that very bad time yeah. and all the things that happened from that and yeah. you know, fell out of that. Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't really, really, really want to stay in that place. I wanted it to just, you have that atmosphere that this is happening. Yeah, this I can feel something's happening, but I don't truly really understand it. I want the kid yeah. to have that kind of standing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's actually so skillfully done as well, the, the point of view of a child, um, that it gives you, the reader, a portal, like a, a way in, a window. Um, but then like a child, you're also sort of distracted by butterfly or, you know, playing um, seven stones or, you know, um, the little fight that you have with your best friend in school or, you know, things like that. So it... 
it kind of also puts things into perspective i feel that like you were saying that you know the expectation is that the the writing and the stories that come out of these places especially like the northeast you know must be sort of serious and must be about the, you know trouble years and they must be written with this particular kind of weight um but you know there are these other stories to tell and a place has so many stories and mustn't be reduced to one single story and um in fact that's what the writer adichi sort of talked about in her in her little uh head talk i think the importance of having a multitude of stories coming from a place and i'm so glad that yours sort of really breathes sort of fresh life into you know um so there's the literature that's kind of coming out of of of, of the northeast <laughs> Um, we have a bunch of audience questions for you, um, Ariba. Um, so I'm just going to go into them, uh, uh, if that's okay. Um, Joni has asked a very interesting one. How did you figure out the pattern in which you wanted the stories to be told? Um, was there, uh, was there, you know, a kind of rationale behind this? Was it chronological for you? yeah the story yeah is that that's the question yeah 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 so the stories are chronological they are her growing up from a certain age from said although i have not mentioned age in all the stories i have because growing up yeah. age is a numerical thing you know you, you don't grow up based on you know the number you experience and understand things yeah as a result of experiences mm -hmm. and uh, these experiences they start from yes it is chronological yeah. and uh, i did intend for it to be chronological even yeah. though there is no um a clear you know demarcation of time yeah. i do mention certain public events as well that yeah. happen chronologically to mark time yeah. to mark time to mark the passage of time uh, like mention the buns yeah happening in the early 2000s and yeah. 90s and then the revival that happens in, you know yeah. later so yeah. they do mark the passage of time but i did not want i didn't want a hard and fast rule that yeah. there should be a date or an age yeah. mentioned specifically yeah absolutely because also memory doesn't function that way right that, exactly it exactly. functions so dubiously and so you know in such murky ways um that it's hard to be completely sort of um you know clear and precise about things but is there a reason i was just wondering and this is my own question but i'm going to slip it in here very quickly is there a reason why memory has come to be so important to you at this point in your life maybe maybe i have more time to sit and think about things or remember things or maybe because i'm away from home you know uh, i'm away from home so i think about home and in thinking about home i think about the people that shaped me yeah. and the things i thought about at 20 are so different from what i think about now and then you know how you have you know you, you the train of thought you you start with something and then you say how did i get here why do i have these thoughts why did i think this thing when i was 15 then i'm like, oh i remember i that happened and this happened so maybe now i'm i it's just backtracking on all the all the opinions i have now the thoughts i have now based on how they've shaped my informed and informed opinions now <laughs> no so lovely um thank you for that um so there is other questions mostly when will the book be available <laughs> um oh. in physical form in hard cover um or otherwise that's that's a few people asking that so so we definitely must answer that that's a very important question <laughs> uh the so i'm hoping uh, we are hoping everything is going according to plan so we are hoping by in a couple of months the, it oh. will be out the physical copy oh, the, the pandemic has really put a spanner in the works yeah. and yeah. you know given everybody 
tough time. So yeah. in a couple of months, it should be out. Quite confident about that. Okay. Well, I can't wait. Um, Nitin asks, who are some of your contemporaries that you admire? Are there writers that you sort of read uh, here and now that you particularly love? I don't get, sadly, I don't get so much time to read now as it, when I was younger. And I feel terrible that I didn't read more when I was younger, when I had the time. And now when I want to read more, I'm just, now it's just a thing of buying more and more books. Oh, you hear about this new writer and then just filling up my house with books that I don't know when I'll read. But uh, I recently read uh, Elizabeth Strout's uh, Olive Kittredge and she writes beautifully. And like uh, you have, I think, I don't know. Um, I wish I read more Indian writers. I'm sorry to say I don't. Read maybe because the marketing is not as aggressive. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm starting to get into reading more yeah. writers. I think I, I will start. I'm thinking I will go through the these lit fest names that are coming up and start reading them one yeah. by one. And yeah. you know, you follow certain bookstagrammers and they recommend a book, and then you're like, okay, let me try that. And you know, so. Elizabeth Trout, Rachel Cusk, these are great, yeah. great writers right it's now. Great writers. Yeah, yeah, super. No, and like we said at the beginning of this uh, conversation, that books always find you at the right time. So, yeah. you know, we have our winters while reading as well, and we have a spring at some point. So, yeah. um, you know, it it flows, it comes and goes. I don't think reading can be a constantly you know, um, sort of a constantly uh, done thing. Um, yeah. we, we, we have seasons in our reading lives as well. Okay. You know? yeah. <laughs> um, and someone else asking, when will the book be available in physical form? Clearly, everybody wants to get their hands. Um, yeah. Not everybody has a Kindle and it's difficult to read on the computer. It is, it is. So much nicer to have a physical yeah. um, Amarilda says, I've been waiting for this session for a week now. I love Dariba's use of Kasi words and conversational passage, which, may, which makes it so much, so much more natural. I totally agree with her. I can relate to her a lot. Could you please tell us the importance of using these Kasi words to make it more relatable, James? Uh, you know, you, when we talk, uh, and although, you know, having lived out of Shillong for such a long time, you just yeah. slip into English all the time, yeah. you don't talk in your native tongue anymore, but yeah. there are just certain words that you just can't translate, you just yeah. can't, and that's in every native tongue, there are Hindi words you can't translate, because you just, yeah. the essence of it is lost, yeah. you know, and yeah. that's the thing, when I wrote them, I just didn't, I didn't want to have to translate them and they weren't so important that they had any bearing on the story. In the, it, it was just, you know, to kind of, it was a way to, of expulsion of emotion, let's say. Yeah. Just, it's just a way for me to show how this person was feeling. If there, a Kasi person was reading it, they would get it. But, yeah. you know, it's just sometimes the joke is funnier in Kasi than it is in English and translating it would just take away the essence of it. So in the same way, I just didn't want to take away the essence of certain words, yeah. certain things by translating them. I wanted to leave them as they were. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that was a really uh, good uh, sort of call on your part because I really think that the, um, like um, Emerilda said, I think that the, the dialogue between characters felt so natural and so sort of real to the ear if that makes sense, yeah, because it's, yeah, yeah. it's so yeah. spoken. Um, I thought it worked so, so well. Um, I feel like we've, we've run out a little bit of time. This always happens because there are a million more questions and um, so many more things to talk about. Yes. Um, but this has been so, so incredible. I've so enjoyed talking with you, Dariba, and I really hope uh, we can actually meet in Dylan's yes. for, for coffee yes. and a chat. Yes. Um, really looking forward to when the book will be out, um, you said, in a couple of months in sort of physical 
hardback um, form. I want to book a signed copy right away. Of course, definitely. <laughs> And um, you know, I know we we haven't quite got to the bit where you tell us, you know, what other exciting stories, you know, you're working on, um, but um, we can we can save that for for future conversations and um, future chats. Yeah. So yeah. just want to thank you so much for being thank so you. wonderful. Thank you. thank you for interviewing me. Thank you for all the lovely questions. Thank you for putting me at ease. <laughs> This was such a nice, it was like, like you said, chatting in your home over yeah. a cup of tea. It's really nervous about, you know, seeming, you know, silly or rapid. Ended. Yeah, but it was so nice of you and all your questions were so spot on. And you got, you got everything spot on. I'm so glad. I feel, I feel relieved. I feel so, you know, I feel it's ecstatic. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so, so glad. And we will meet and we yes, will, definitely. you know, um, we can give each other a hug and you can sign my book for me. Yes, and you can sign my your book for me. <laughs> would be so happy to. Tariba, thank you so much. Jayla, thank you so much. This was, like I said, such a special session for two Shillong girls to get together and yet Yes. <laughs> thank you, Jayla. Thank you for having me. You take care. Thank you, Dariba and Janice, for the delightful session. We thank our celebration partner, Diageo, and would also like to thank all of you for being such a supportive audience. If you enjoyed the session, please do pick up your copy of the book from the Amazon online bookstore. Do stay tuned in to our other sessions that we have specially curated for you. Please do tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2021 and tag us at Jaipur Lit Fest. The festival is protected by Detol. We hope to see you in our other sessions. To all storytellers and story lovers, my name is Laksh Tata. I host and produce the Jaipur Bites podcast, where you can hear many of the amazing sessions from the Jaipur Literature Festival. I also produce a few other podcasts, as you can see right here. English, Hindi, fiction, non-fiction. If you see something you like, maybe you can take a screenshot of this right now. I'll give you a second. And tune in later. Find them on your favorite podcast app.